Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering more fluid and electrolytes. Before we even get started, you know you're gonna love the video, so please do it now. Like this video so you don't forget. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. Don't forget I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Now, before we get started, I'd like to start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, that's fine. Just fast forward, and if you are, close your eyes, bow your heads. Father God, thank you, Lord for all that you've done for us. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies, Father God. Lord, we ask you for forgiveness for our sins. We know we fall short of your glory every single second. But God, we tell you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you for already forgiving our sins. All we have to do is ask and we know that's already been, get, uh, been forgiven. Father God, I want to use this opportunity right now to pray for the children that are going back to school this week. Father God, I pray for every single child that's going back to school. Lord, I ask that you please protect them, Jesus Christ. Protect them, keep them, Father God. Protect them physically, emotionally, spiritually, Father God. Allow these children to come back home safely to their parents. And Father God, I pray for every single viewer here that is a parent, that's an aunt, that's an uncle, that has a loved one that is going back to school, Jesus. Lord, I ask that you please relieve any concerns or anxiety that they may have, Father God. Let them trust in you, Jesus. And I ask that you please keep these children safe, Lord. Father God, I pray over the teachers that are going to be teaching these children, Father God. Lord, I ask that you allow them to have the right mind. And I ask that you protect every single campus from crazy people trying to do anything to harm these children, Lord. I ask that you protect them, protect them, protect them. And Father God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity that you've given us, Lord, to go over this information, Lord. I ask, I pray for every single viewer right now. Um, they've all come for a different reason. Lord, I ask that you bless them. I ask that you please help them to understand this information, to retain this information, Father God, to be able to process this information. And when they see it again, to be able to think critically and get to the right answer. And Lord, I ask that you please allow them to use that license that they're working so hard for. Help them to get that license and, license and allow them to be a blessing to someone else, Father God. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your favor over our lives. Thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you will continue to do for us. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. An IV solution of 125 milliliters is to be infused over a one hour period. A micro drip infusion set will be used. The nurse calculates the infusion rate as 132 drops per minute, 260 drops per minute, 3, 125 drops per minute, or 4, 250 drops per minute. What do you guys think? By the way, guys, I already did another video. Actually, I have a couple now on fluid electrolytes. Um, and I also did a couple videos where I showed you, showed you how to do the nursing math. It's very simple. Go back and watch uh, them if you haven't done so already. So guys, the correct answer is 125 drops per minute. How do we come up with this? Well, the formula, guys, is your volume times your drip factor all over time in minutes. So your volume is 125 milliliters times your drip factor. They told you micro drip, so you're gonna do times 60, right? So you have your 125 times 60 all over your time in minutes. They told you one hour. One hour is what? 60 minutes. So 125 times 60 all over 60, that's gonna give you your 125. So you, it's gonna be 125 drops per minute. Make sure you cap, uh, watch my video on nursing math if you haven't done so already. Next question. A client admitted to the hospital with a diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency. In preparing to complete the admission history, the nurse anticipates that the client will have experienced one, decreased muscle tone, two, hypertension, three, diarrhea, or four, fever. And guys, the correct answer is three, diarrhea. So let's talk about this, guys. If you go back to the question, we have a couple hints. They tell us that the patient has a diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency. When you see or hear adrenal insufficiency, what should be going to your mind? Addison's disease. Addison's disease where you need to add salt, add sex, add sugar. Patient doesn't have enough salt. That's your um, mineral cortical steroids. That's your um, sodium. They don't have enough sex. Those are your androgen hormones. They don't have enough sugar. Those are your glucocorticoids. They're missing it. They have a deficient level of them, right? Okay, so it says the patient's in adrenal insufficiency. I told you you need to be thinking of Addison's. They're low on salt, sex, and sugar. When you look at your choices, the correct answer is diarrhea. Um, hyponatremia, 
low sodium can cause diarrhea, abdominal um, cramps, nausea, vomiting. Those are signs and symptoms of hyponatremia. Remember, when it comes to sodium, sodium has a well, sodium range is not narrow, but there is a safe range for sodium, and it's 135 to 145. 135 to 145. Anything less than 135, the patient is hyponatremic. If a patient has adrenal insufficiency, they're most likely what? Hyponatremic. So we're going to be looking for those signs of hyponatremia. Choice three that diarrhea, the abdominal cramps, the nausea, vomiting, right? Let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, um, decreased muscle tones. Ap actually, guys, when it comes to hyponatremia, we expect to see that patient having abdominal cramps, not decreased muscle tones, right? We expect them to have abdominal cramps or sp uh, spasms of the muscle. Choice two, hypertension. If that patient has hyponatremia, decreased sodium, right? What follows sodium? Fluid. So if they have decreased sodium, that fluid is going to be lower. So there's not going to be much fluid pushing against the vascular, sp uh, vascular space, like vascular wall. What is hypertension? Hypertension is the amount or the force of that fluid pushing against the vessel wall. So no, we would not expect to see hypertension in adrenal insufficiency. If anything, that patient may be hypotensive because of the decreased sodium. Remember, decreased sodium, decreased fluids because the fluids follow the sodium. Choice um, four, fever. We would actually see this in a patient that is hypernatremic, right? With that sodium higher than 135 to 145. So higher than 145, we would expect to see fever, not in a patient that's hyponatremic, okay? So the correct answer, guys, is number three, diarrhea. In reviewing the results of the client's blood work, the nurse recognizes that the unexpected value that should be reported to the healthcare provider is one, calcium 3.9, two, sodium 140, three, potassium 3.5, or four, magnesium of 2.1. What do you guys think? Okay, guys, so the only one that's out of range that you would be reporting to the healthcare provider is going to be your calcium. It says the calcium is 3.9, but the regular range is what? 4.5 to 5.5, okay? So 3.9, that patient is hypocalcemic. And you know with hypocalcemia, that patient's going to have those signs and symptoms of what? Tetany, um, nerve irritation, Okay, so one's the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Sodium of 140, nothing wrong with that. The normal range is 135 to 145. I just explained that in the last question. Choice three, potassium of 3.5. Even though that 3.5 is right there at the cusp of the normal range, it's still within normal range because potassium is 3.5 to 5. So that patient is at 3.5, they're at the cusp of the bottom, excuse me, because I think I had up here, of the lower end of the normal range, but they're still there, 3.5 to 5, that is the normal range. Now, if that patient's 3.4, we have a problem, because remember, potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range. We want to keep them right in there, 3.5 to 5, but at 3.5, it's still normal. And then lastly, magnesium at 2.1. Nothing's wrong with that, guys. With magnesium, we're at 1.5 to 2.5. That's the normal range. That patient falls right within that normal range. So the correct answer, guys, is choice number one, the calcium of 3.9. That patient would be hypocalcemic. The nurse anticipates that the client with fluid volume excess will manifest, one, increased urine-specific gravity, two, decreased body weight, three, increased blood pressure, or four, decreased pulse strength. And you guys should all get this answer because I kind of gave you the answer as I was explaining something else. What do you guys think? All right, guys, if you guys chose three, you got it correct. Think about it. Fluid volume excess. When we're talking about fluid volume excess, them having too much fluid, what are we talking about? Within the vessels, right? Patients having too much fluid in the vessels. That's a lot of fluid pushing against those vessels wall, vessel walls. We expect that blood pressure to be increased. Increased blood pressure, hypertension. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Increased urine specific gravity, decreased body weight, decreased pulse strength. We see that in fluid uh, volume deficit. 
right? That patient may be dehydrated. So choices one, two, and four, we see in fluid volume deficit, but choice three, that hypertension, we see it in fluid volume excess. The nurse recognizes that the client based on the nurse recognizes that the client based on the imbalance that is present will require fluid replacement with isotonic solution one of the isotonic solutions that may be ordered by the healthcare provider is one half normal half saline two lactate ringers three five percent dextrose in normal saline or four five percent dextrose in lactate ringers And guys, the correct answer is to lactate ringers. So when it comes to lactate ringers or even normal saline, right? Those two are isotonic solutions that keep the fluid um, within the, 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 the vessel space. It's not pulling or pushing out. It keeps it within the vessels. Those are your isotonic fluids. By the way, um, isotonic fluids such as lactate ringers or normal saline, these are our fluids of choice for patients with what? Burns. Okay, keep that in mind. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, half normal saline. That is a hypotonic solution. Choice three and four, the 5% dextrose in normal saline, the 5% dextrose in that lactate ringers, those are hypertonic solutions. But this question is asking for an isotonic solution, so it would be choice two, lactate ringers. A client has severe anemia and will be receiving blood transfusions. The nurse prepares and begins infusion. 10 minutes after infusion's begun, the, chi the child, the client develops tachycardia, chills, and low back pain. After stopping the infusion, the nurse should one, administer an antipyretic, two, begin an infusion of epinephrine, three, run normal saline through the blood tubing, or four, obtain and send a urine specimen to the laboratory. And guys, the correct answer is four. Obtain and send a urine specimen to the laboratory. What do we suspect is happening here? We're suspecting a hemolytic reaction. So the reason we're sending that urine to the laboratory, we want to look to see, do we see RBCs in that urine? Is there supposed to be RBCs in the urine? Absolutely not, right? So that's why we chose four. We suspect that patient's having a hemolytic reaction. And something else I want to point to you, in the question, look how they they address the first thing that you would have done, which is stop the infusion. Whenever infusion, something's harming or injuring your patient, the first thing you're going to do is stop whatever is infusing. Does it make any sense to assess your patient while they're still being murdered by whatever it is that's infusing? Absolutely not. So the first thing you're going to do is stop what's killing them. And the next thing you're going to do is assess, right? So for this one, guys, it's going to be for uh, getting the... Uh, urine specimen. We need to get that specimen to see if this is what we what we suspect. We want to confirm it that the patient had a hemolytic reaction. Next question. A client is prescribed normal saline, which is an isotonic solution. The nurse recognizes the primary goal of such IV infusion is to one, expand the volume in the vascular system, two, pull fluids from the cells, three, keep protein levels normal, or four, move fluid into the cells. And guys, the correct answer is one, expand the volume of fluid within the vascular system. So I think it was the last question or maybe the question before that, I explained to you how lactate ringers and normal saline, they're isotonic solutions that keeps the fluids within um, that vascular space. Well, think about it. If it keeps fluid within that vascular space, what's it gonna do? It's gonna expand that fluid volume within the vascular system. Absolutely, number one's the correct answer. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. Two, pull fluid from the cells. You know what kind of fluid does that? Hypertonic solutions. That pulls fluid out of the cells. Three, keep protein levels normal. What kind of um, fluid are we talking about when it comes to those protein levels, albumin? Four, um, move fluid into the cells. What would that be when we're trying to draw fluid into the cells? Hypo. 
isotonic solutions. So the correct answer, guys, when it comes to isotonic, again, guys, number one, we want to expand um, the fluid volume within the vascular space. A client prescribed 3% sodium chloride, which is a hypertonic solution. The nurse recognizes the primary goal of such IV therapy is to, oh, you guys should all get this right. One, expand the volume of fluid in the vascular system. Two, pull fluid from the cells. Three, keep protein levels normal. Or four, move fluid into the cells. I just talked about this. You should all get the answer correct. And the correct answer is two, pull fluid from the cells. So something such as your sodium chloride, which is a hypertonic solution, that's what you expect it to do, pull fluid from the cells. One, expand the volume ex expand the volume of fluid within the vascular system. Again, that's something like, you know, normal saline or your lactate ringers. Three, keeping the protein um, levels normal. That's something like your albumin. Or four, moving fluid into the cells. That would be something such as your half normal saline, right? So for this question, the correct answer is uh, to pull fluid from the cells. A client is prescribed, oh, I think I gave you the answer to this question. A client is prescribed half sodium chloride, which is a hypotonic solution. The nurse recognizes the primary goal of such IV therapy is to one, expand the volume of fluid in the vascular system, two, pull fluid from the cells, three, keep protein levels normal, or four, move fluid into the cells. You guys should all get this right. Come on, they're drilling this into your heads. What's the correct answer? Four, move fluid into the cells. All right, I think I beat a dead horse. Next question. Let's move on. By the way, guys, if you really appreciate um, this video, it's helpful, you'd like to see more of the fluid and electrolytes, just let me know in the comment section and I'll definitely make, make sure I make more for you. Uh, this, the nurse recognizes which of the following clients is at greatest risk for dehydration. One, 35-year-old diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Two, 15-year-old who's following low-carb diet. Three, two-year-old diagnosed with an allergy to milk proteins. Or four, 79-year-old client diagnosed with advanced Alzheimer's disease. Who's most at risk for dehydration? Now, before I tell you what the answer is, um, I want to review this with you because I talked about I talked about this with you on my last video for fluid and electrolytes. Um, when it comes to dehydration, people who are most at risk are going to be your very, very young, like the infants, right? Very, very old because, you know, they lose their sense of thirst. You have to constantly remind them to drink. Patients with cognitive deficits, right? So when it comes to this, our correct answer is going to be four. The 79-year-old ger of geriatric population diagnosed with Alzheimer's cognition, right? Choice number one, the patient has Crohn's disease. The Crohn's disease puts them at risk because they may have a lot of diarrhea. That's a risk factor. 15-year-old, they're on a low-carb diet. They may not be drinking the way they should. They might, they might not. Um, choice three, a two-year-old, very young, you know, that's a risk factor. But choice four has two risk factors, very old and decreased cognition because of the Alzheimer's. That's why number four is the correct answer. Which of the following clients is at risk for insensible water loss? One, a 37-year-old with superficial burn to the left hand. Two, 15-year-old experiencing an asthmatic attack. Three, 50-year-old with type 2 diabetes. Or four, 73-year-old with a history of pneumonia. And guys, the correct answer is to the 15-year-old experiencing an asthmatic attack. Now, let's go back to the question. They're talking about insensible water loss. That's the water loss through the skin or through the lungs. It's a water loss that you really can't measure, right? Let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, they have a burn, but it's to the left hand. It's not like they have a huge burn where they're losing all of this fluid through their skin, right? So that's, excuse me, they're not at most, they're not most at risk. Three, you're type two with diabetes. No. Four, you're 73 year old with, look what it said, history of pneumonia. It's not like the patient has pneumonia right now, that they have difficulty breathing and they can lose those fluids through the lungs or they have a fever right now, right? Because insensible water loss, you can lose it through the skin 
or through the lungs if the patient is having trouble breathing they could lose um, fluid through the lungs or they have a flu they have a fever they're sweating a lot they can lose the fluid through the skin but it said history of pneumonia not current pneumonia you see how those test writers are trying to trick you don't fall for it it said history we're concerned with who's at risk right now that patient that is experiencing look at at the end of experience ing that means right now it's happening right now an asthma attack they're trying to be <laughs> they're losing fluids from the lungs this is something that's happening to them right now and that's why two is our correct answer and none of the other choices okay Which of the following foods will have the greatest impact on the heart's conductivity of the person consuming it? A, one, a pickle, two, a banana, three, a milkshake, four, spinach salad. We're talking about the heart's conductivity. I know you guys all got this right. You know it's banana because banana's full of what? Potassium. And remember, potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range, 3.5 to 5. Anything outside of that, the patient can have cardiac dysrhythmias, okay? Number two is the correct answer. Now, let's talk about the wrong answer choices. One, a pickle. Pickle's high in what? Sodium. Three, milkshake. Milkshake's high in what? Calcium. And for spinach, spinach is high in what? Magnesium and iron. So the correct answer here, guys, is to the banana. Which of the following foods will have the greatest impact on the blood clotting mechanism of a person consuming it? One, pickle. Two, banana. Three, milkshake. Or four, spinach salad. I love this question because I know a lot of you guys got tricked by it. The correct answer is three, not four. And I'm going to explain it to you. So let's talk about three first. Three, the milkshake. Milkshake's high in what? Calcium. Calcium's good for um, teeth formation, for making the bones strong, and for what? Cardiac conductivity. Uh, excuse me. Um, uh, excuse me. Um, I can't even think, guys. <laughs> for um, blood clotting mechanism, okay? So three is the correct answer. Now, spinach, let me talk to you guys about the spinach for, uh, for a second. I know you are looking at spinach because we know patients who are taking, um, what do we call it? I'm having a brain fart, give me a second, guys. Patients who are, what is that oral anticoagulant that the patients take? Um, Coumadin. Okay, so <laughs> patients that are taking Coumadin, we tell them to be careful and not to eat too many foods that are high in um, vitamin K because vitamin K is the antidote for Coumadin, right? And so we know that green leafy veggies such as spinach is high in vitamin K. And so I know that's what you were thinking, but there's nothing here in this question that... T t is talking about that patient even on Coumadin. Look at what the question is asking us. Go back and look what it says. Greatest impact on the blood clotting mechanism of the person that is um, consuming it. And guys, three is the correct answer because besides the bone and the teeth, it absolutely ha um, has an effect on blood cl clotting and even hormone secretion. So three is the correct answer. Read very carefully because they will try to trick you. And I know that's where your brains went. Most of you, you were thinking of anticoagulants such as a Coumadin and you went to choice four. Three is the correct answer. Which of the following foods will have the greatest impact on the neurochemical activity of the person consuming it? One, the pickle. Two, banana. Three, magnesium. Excuse me, three, milkshake. Or four, spinach salad. I'm sorry. What do you guys think? 
And guys, number four is the correct answer. Spinach salad. Spinach is high in what? Magnesium. Okay, so magnesium, guys, is good for neurochemical um, activities and cardiac excitability. So uh, four is the correct answer. I feel like there's something else I wanted to tell you about spinach. They'll come to me. I'm having a brain fart, but there's something else I want to tell you about spinach. But anyways, guys, uh, spinach is the correct answer because of that, excuse me, because of that, the magnesium. Next question, which of the following clinical assessment findings is most likely seen in the client experiencing hypernatremia as a result of diabetes insipidus? One, dry sticky tongue, two, increased anxiety, three, nausea and vomiting, four, decreased bowel sounds. Now, before I tell you what the answer is, let's talk about this for a second. So the patient is having high sodium. Remember, sodium is 135 to 145. So their sodium is higher than 145 as a result of diabetes insipidus. Remember, diabetes insipidus is the condition where the patient doesn't have enough antidiuretic hormone and they are urinating all over the place. Like they're getting rid of all their fluids. They're at risk for dehydration. But even though they're getting rid of the fluids, the fluids, the urine is very dilute. Why? Because all of the solutes have stayed um, in the patient's bloodstream, right? The glucose, the sodium, all of that is staying in the bloodstream. So even though they're releasing these large amounts of fluid, the urine is dilute. The blood is concentrated. So with that being said, patient has hypernatremia, too much sodium in the blood. What, what signs and symptoms will we see? The correct answer is one, dry, sticky tongue. Dry, sticky tongue, fever, weakness, increased thirst. Those are signs and symptoms of hypernatremia. Um, choices two, and by the way, let me go back to choice number one. Where I said weakness, let me change that, restlessness. That patient's gonna be very restless with the hypernatremia. Um, choice two, increased anxiety, we see that in what? Hyponatremia. Choice three, nausea and vomiting, we see that in what? hyperkalemia, the potassium being high. And then for decreased bowel sounds, we see that what? Hypokalemia, decreased potassium. But for hypernatremia, the sodium being too high, dry sticky tongue. That is the correct answer. Which of the following clinical assessment findings is most likely seen in a client experiencing hypokalemia as a result of the misuse of potassium wasting diuretic. So before I give you the answer to this, let's talk about this for a second. Go back to the question. It says um, misuse of potassium wasting diuretic. What is a potassium wasting diuretic? Something like a LASIK. La, la, LASIK makes you la, la, lose potassium. So if the patient's using it too much, that's gonna throw them into hypokalemic state where the potassium is too low. That potassium is lower than 3.5 to five. So what clinical manifestations can we see in this type of patient? And the correct answer is four, decreased bowel sounds. Decreased bowel sounds, weakness, fatigue, decreased deep tendon uh, reflexes. Four is the correct answer. One, dry, sticky tongue, we see that in hypernatremia. Two, increased anxiety, we see that in hyponatremia. Three, nausea and vomiting, we see that in hyperkalemia. And four is our correct answer for hypokalemia, decreased bowel sounds. And guys, we are down to our last question. Which of the following clinical assessment findings is most likely seen in the client experiencing hyperkalemia as a result of adrenal insufficiency? And we talked about adrenal insufficiency. So you know when you see adrenal insufficiency, you, be th you should be thinking of Addison's disease where the patient does not have enough salt, sex, and sugar, right? So it says here the patient has hyperkalemia because of Addison's. And that makes sense, guys. Because if in Addison's patients does not have enough salt, sex, and sugar, that means all of them are low, doesn't potassium and sodium have an inverse relationship? Which means if that sodium is low, we expect the potassium to be what? High. So we're looking for a sign and symptom of hyperkalemia. Guys, I'm so sorry. Usually I announce when it's the last question, but I didn't realize I'd already run out of questions <laughs> 
that was the last question. So please let me know in the comment section if you'd like to see me cover more questions or topics such as this, let me know and I will definitely put it on my list to do so. Please don't forget to like this video if you haven't done so already. So subscribe to this channel, share my content um, with friends or anyone you think that this video would be helpful to. Don't forget, um, almost daily you can catch me covering different types of content on my other social media uh, platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.